So this mind of ours has incredible potential. Not only is it endowed with the Buddha potential, the empty nature of the mind, but also the conventional nature of the mind is clear light. So the mind has the nature of being able to know and reflect objects. And it's only because of certain obstacles that we aren't able to know all the various things in the universe. So that potential is there if we can tap into it. And similarly, the mental factors of compassion, loving kindness, integrity, and so forth are there in our minds. They're underdeveloped, but they can never be removed from the mind. And so again, these are factors that can be developed infinitely, limitlessly, and put to very good use to benefit ourselves and others. So it's really rather sad when we use the potential, our great potential, to worry about silly things, to get angry at other people, <clears throat> to cling on to things that aren't worth clinging on to, to get jealous of somebody. All of that's such a, a waste of our potential. So even if we just have some notion of our potential in a conceptual way, if we can remember that, then that will help us not get distracted by all these petty things and not fall into uh, ruminating with so many disturbing emotions. And instead, use our time and our energy and our ability to develop the potential of our mind, to develop our excellent qualities, and then use them for the benefit of all living beings. So let's keep that as our motivation for our sharing together this evening and for the whole retreat. I want to welcome everybody to the retreat. And like I said, actually it should be Geshe teaching this session, not me. Uh, however, the way I can justify it is that we're going through His Holiness's book, Approaching the Buddhist Path. So it's actually His Holiness's teachings. Yeah. Otherwise, I don't dare say anything. <laughs> So um, we started this book a few years ago, a few <laughs> weeks ago. <laughs> Actually, I started it many years ago. Yeah, <laughs> many, many years ago. And, uh, you know, His Holiness began by, uh, you know, placing uh, Buddhism in context, you know, where it fits with other religions, where it fits with science and so on. And uh, then he jumped in and started giving us all this philosophy, you know. Uh, no simple, easy, uh, be nice to other people kind of stuff. He, but he, uh, you know, like I said last week, he knows that, that his uh, Western students have an education and um, you know, want to learn the basic fundamental principles of Buddhism. 
So he just jumps in, you know, and starts out with the nature of mind and <laughs> rebirth and all these things that, uh, you know, may be rather difficult to understand. But he also doesn't expect us to ever understand everything the first time we hear it. Yeah, the idea is that we hear something, we think about it, we hear it again, we think about it some more, we test it in our own experience, you know, we test it using reasoning. And it's through a slow process of really engaging with the material that then we come to have confidence in the teachings and to practice them. So that takes time, and we aren't expected to understand everything at once. So it's not like our regular education, you know, where you go to school and then you take a test and tell the teacher what they already know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's really uh, an education for our own personal growth, and so it depends what we put into it, you know, how much we get out of it. So we're on page 27, um, you know, in the last uh, section he talked about body, mind, rebirth, and self, and now he's getting into the four truths of the Aryas, okay, the Aryas uh, being uh, beings who have uh, seen the nature uh, or realize the nature of reality directly with their own experience. So these are four um, things that the Arya beings have seen as true. So His Holiness starts out, the topics of the first discourse the Buddha gave after attaining awakening, the four truths of the Aryas, well known as the four noble truths, form the foundation and structure of the Buddhist path. Yeah, so it's really important that we learn what these are because everything is based on them. Yeah. Each sentient being has the innate wish for stable peace, happiness, and freedom from suffering. The longing for these motivates us to engage in many activities in an attempt to gain them. However, until now, everything we have done has not brought about the stable peace and joy that we want because we live in cyclic existence, or samsara, the state of having a body and mind under the influence of mental afflictions and karma. So have you ever wondered why you have a body? Yeah? I mean, we're born with this body, and so often, we, well, we just take it for granted. Yeah, we have a body. Yeah, there's some conscious part of us, and here we are. Uh, but, you know, did you ever stop and wonder why? You know, why do we have a body, and how did we get here, and what's the purpose of it all? Yeah, did you ever stop and wonder that? I did as a teenager, you know, quite, you know, kind of, what is all of this world about? It is so confusing. Yeah. These adults are supposed to be smart, but what they're doing is not very smart. Any of you have that problem? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I grew up in the middle of the Vietnam War, and we're killing people in order to live in peace. And these are the smart people who were telling me that, the adults. And I'm going, that doesn't sound smart to me. Yeah. <laughs> so I had these kinds of questions. Within cyclic existence, or samsara, we encounter only dukkha. So dukkha is a Sanskrit uh, and uh, Pali word that means unsatisfactory conditions and suffering. Okay, sometimes it's translated just as suffering, but that's inaccurate. Yeah, because within samsara, within cyclic existence, you know, would you say you're suffering all the time? 
No, we, we don't say we're suffering all the time. Would you say that you don't have optimum conditions? Yeah. Would you say there's unsatisfactory conditions in your life? Yeah. But that doesn't mean that we're going, oh, this hurts, you know, all the time. It certainly doesn't. Yeah. So dukkha is, that's why I, I keep the, the uh, Sanskrit word, you know, because uh, it, if we say suffering, it really gives us the wrong notion. Yeah. Okay, so without choice, we take a body that gets old, sick, and dies and have a mind that becomes anxious, fearful, and angry. Would you call that unsatisfactory? I would. Yeah, I mean, if you had your choice about a body, would you take one like this? <laughs> yeah. If you could go shopping for bodies, would you take a body that gets old and sick and dies? No, you know, so this is not happening by our choice. You know, it's coming about through previous causes and conditions. And we're the ones who created those causes and conditions. So the I, the person that is merely designated in dependence upon the body and mind, revolves in cyclic existence. Our five aggregates of body and mind are unsatisfactory by nature and constitute the first truth of the Aryas, the truth of dukkha. Okay. So it's said that we have five aggregates yeah, that form our body and mind. An aggregate is a heap, a collection. Okay. So the first one is form or the body. That's the physical aggregate. Then we have four mental ones. Feelings, which means uh, pain, pleasure, neutral feelings. Discriminations that enable us to discern objects. Another grab bag of miscellaneous factors. That translation term being courteous of Geshe-la. <laughs> but it's a good one, you know. It's where you put all the other emotions and attitudes and, you know, it goes in that one. And then the fifth aggregate is consciousness, which means uh, our five sense consciousnesses plus the mental consciousness. Okay? And so of these five aggregates, one is physical, the body, and four are mental. Okay? So the causes of our five aggregates are mental afflictions, skewed attitudes and disturbing emotions, the chief of which is ignorance and polluted actions. These constitute the second truth, the true origins of dukkha. Okay, so we're saying, you know, why do we have this body? Why did we take rebirth? You know, why are we born as who we are? Did you ever wonder that one? Why, why are you born who you are? Why weren't you born somebody else? Why weren't you born in another country, in another family? Yeah. So all of this happens due to causes. Yeah. And from a Buddhist viewpoint, yeah, the it starts with a fundamental ignorance that uh, we misapprehend how things exist, including how we ourselves exist. And then from that develop various afflictions. Some are wrong views. Some are disturbing emotions, clinging attachment, arrogance, jealousy, resentment, these kinds of things. And then due to these views and attitudes and disturbing emotions, we act. We think, we say, and we do things. Yeah. And so these actions are what we call karma. Yeah. The karma... Our actions, they don't just kind of vanish into nowhere, but they leave some trace after them. Yeah. Sometimes we call these karmic seeds. Sometimes we call them um, having, uh, having ceased. There's lots of different terms for them. Uh, 
But they will ripen and influence who we're reborn as, uh, where we're reborn, uh, what kind of habits we have, what kind of situations we encounter. Okay, and so from a Buddhist perspective, all of this actually originates with our mind. Yeah, and especially originates with this fundamental ignorance. Okay, but not being aware of it, yeah, not realizing that our mind is the source of our happiness and pain, we keep trying to control the external world and make it be what we want it to be. Yeah. And so from morning to night, that's basically what we do, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Wake up. Got to get some tea, coffee, breakfast. Okay. Interacting with the world. What do I have to do today? Oh, I have to do this and this and this and this. Again, you know, interacting. How am I going to line everything up? You know, oh, I have to see this person at work today. I don't like that person. This is going to be a nuisance. How can I get out of it? Yeah. Or whatever is happening. And so we're always trying to mm, rearrange the world. You may have noticed uh, on our, uh, our dining room tables, some of the tables have little plastic ducks on them. Actually, we have a whole bunch of plastic ducks. Somebody uh, sent us uh, a whole bunch of them, yeah. And the reason is because I often joke about, uh, remember when we were little kids and we had, uh, when you took a bath and you had little plastic duckies? Remember that? And you would line up your duckies in your bathtub and then a wave would come because you moved your leg or your, you know, your other sibling jumped in or something. And all the duckies would get unorganized and you'd have to line them up again. Yeah. So this is kind of what we're doing with the external world all day. Lining up our duckies and then them getting out of order and us having to line them up again. Okay? So uh, that's why we have little duckies all around. Okay? It's to remind ourselves that, you know, trying to control the world and make everybody else do and be what we want them to be and do is really rather fruitless. Because we can't control them. The only thing we have any possibility of managing and taming is our own mind. And yet we usually ignore our own mind and look outside and try and change everybody else and everything else. And then complain when people don't do what we want them to do. (sighs) Okay, and so that just keeps us going around in the circle all the time. Okay, so those are the first two, the truth of dukkha, the unsatisfactory experiences, and the truth of its origins. So starting with ignorance, then wrong views and afflictive emotions, and then these create karma, which ripen in terms of our experience. Then the final true cessation, which is the third truth, is liberation and nirvana, the state of peace, joy, and fulfillment that we seek. Here, ignorance, afflictions, and polluted actions, and the unsatisfactory experiences they cause, have been extinguished from the root so that they can no longer arise. So this whole cycle we're in, yeah, it does have an end, but we're the ones who have to end it. Yeah, if we don't do something, it's going to keep going on and on and on. Okay, because we keep creating the causes. But if we put forth the end, uh, put forth the energy, then we can attain the true cessation. So that's the third truth. 
True cessations are attained by depending on a method that eradicates ignorance. So this is true paths, the fourth truth, which consists uh, primarily of the wisdom realizing the ultimate, ultimate nature, the emptiness of inherent existence of all persons and phenomena. And the virtuous consciousness is supported by that wisdom. Okay, so true cessations is what we're aiming at, the absence or uh, cessation from the root of all the unsatisfactory experiences and their causes. And then true paths are the mental consciousnesses that we need to generate that will overcome the origins, obliterate the dukkha, and leave us with true cessations. Okay? These paths require time and diligent effort to develop. We cannot hire someone else to accomplish them, like employing a mechanic to fix our car. Gee, yeah, wouldn't that be nice? Like, oh, I'm really too tired tonight to do some meditation. You know, can I give you a dollar or two and you'll meditate for me and then I'll get the merit and the benefit of the meditation? You know, wouldn't that be nice to be able to do? Yeah, uh-huh. So how, how can we make a sponsoring a puja beneficial? <laughs> so sponsoring a, a, a puja so that other people will create merit and then we reap the benefit. This is actually, you're asking that question, huh? It's a good question. It's a good question, yeah. Um, in terms of sponsoring pujas, I have a, a lot of different ideas about them. I mean, one is you're asking somebody else to do something virtuous, and so that, you know, makes your mind virtuous when you, when you do that. Um, you know, another is by the force of people dedicating for the benefit of somebody, yeah, that can have an effect perhaps on somebody's mind. And then also I think it makes the living people feel better. <laughs> yeah, I think it makes people feel better. But there, you know, there is something to it also. How to cultivate these paths and actualize nirvana is the subject of this series. So all this, you want to know? what um, the Library of Wisdom and Compassion is all about. It's about how to cultivate the past and actualize nirvana. Okay? In a lot of words or more. <laughs> <laughs> the process of attaining nirvana begins with understanding the first truth, the nature of dukkha, and the various types of unsatisfactory circumstances and suffering that afflicts sentient beings in cyclic existence. When some people hear this, they fear that reflecting on their suffering may only make it worse, and therefore believe that no benefit would come from learning the Buddha's teachings. This would be true if it were impossible to free ourselves from the causes of dukkha. However, since the uh, root cause of dukkha, ignorance, which is a mental factor that misapprehends reality and grasps phenomena as existing inherently. Since this ignorance is erroneous, it can be eliminated by the wisdom that sees things as they really are, as empty of having some uh, inherent or intrinsic uh, essence or nature. By gradually eradicating ignorance and other afflictions, we can bring greater satisfaction and freedom into our lives. After all its causes have been accumulated, we attain the final true cessation of dukkha and its causes, which is called nirvana. While nirvana may sound like a far-off goal, we can easily see steps going in that direction. The more we cease anger, the greater harmony we experience. And the more our greed diminishes, the greater contentment we will have. 
As we gradually reduce ignorance and afflictions through the application of wisdom, tranquility, of, through the application of wisdom, tranquility and fulfillment correspondingly increase, culminating in nirvana. Okay? So because the root cause of cyclic existence is an erroneous mental state, by understanding how things actually exist, that wisdom mental state can overpower the erroneous one and after a while cut it off from its root. When the ignorance is cut off from its root, everything that had grown out of it, yeah, the greed, resentment, grudge holding, belligerence, arrogance, and on and on, all of those things that depended on ignorance to exist, when the ignorance is uprooted, all those things fall away too. Okay, so sometimes uh, people say, well, what is nirvana like? Yeah, and, uh, you know, for me, just to, to get some little idea about what it might be like, I imagine um, n- never getting angry again. In other words, not having the potential for anger. So that whatever people said or did or thought about me, my mind would just be completely harmonious. I wouldn't get all wigged out. Yeah? Now think about that for a minute. Does that sound nice? Yeah, for me, the idea of never getting angry again, not because I'm stuffing my anger down, not because I'm whitewashing situations, but because the potential for anger has been eliminated. Yeah, so I'm not sensitive about what people think about me anymore, and I don't really care what they say about me behind my back. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not putting all sorts of importance on all sorts of little things so I don't get aggravated and upset when things don't go the way I want them to go. Wow, that would, that would be a nice mental state. Yeah? Then, wherever I go, whatever I encounter, whatever people say and do, I'm Okay. They can call me names. They can beat me up. I'm okay. I'm not going to get angry. I'm not going to get offended and insulted. So when I think about that, you know, well, that's like a little taste of what nirvana could be like. You know, of course, it's much, much more. But that little, little taste gives gives us some idea of um, the peace and contentment that we can attain. Here, recognizing and reflecting on our suffering has a special beneficial purpose. It activates us to discover its roots and subsidiary causes and to eradicate them by practicing the path to peace that leads to the true freedom of nirvana. So the reason that we contemplate All these unsatisfactory circumstances in our life is not to make us depressed because the Buddha didn't need to teach, give teachings on how to become depressed. Uh, We can do that all by ourselves, thank you very much. Okay, so that's not the purpose of the Buddha saying contemplate unsatisfactory conditions. But it's more of... um, they use the example, if you're an inmate in prison, yeah, and uh, you don't quite realize you're in prison, you're just so used to it that, well, everything's okay. You know, what they say, you have three hots and a cot. Yeah, so what's wrong with it? You know, I can go watch TV a little bit. 
I have some friends around. Okay, it's pretty ugly and awful sometimes, but yeah, I'm fed. I have a place to sleep. It's you know, it's it's okay. So if you're in prison and you feel like that about your prison, then you're not going to try and do anything to get out. Yeah. You're just going to maybe, you know, decorate your cell a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. What I call tweak your samsara. <laughs> yeah. Oh, look, I, I revamped my cell. I cleaned the, you know, the stainless steel bed. Yeah. So instead of thinking, oh, it's possible to have a really comfortable bed, you're satisfied with cleaning your stainless steel bed. Okay. So the idea of, you know, why do we think about the truth of dukkha is to energize us so that we will overcome its causes and find real peace. Okay. Like... You know, if you really keep pointing out to somebody in prison how awful it is, you know, eventually, and that there is an alternative, you know, it's not that everybody has to stay in prison their whole life. Then people will try and do something to get out. Okay, so it's the same kind of idea. The Buddha spoke of three types of dukkha. The first is the dukkha of pain. This is the physical and mental suffering that we all see as undesirable. All world religions agree that destructive actions such as killing, stealing, and lying bring physical and or mental pain. To counter this pain and the actions that cause it, all religions teach some form of ethical conduct. True. Scientists also seek to remedy physical and mental pain. They do this by developing the means to change its external causes that are in our environment or due to the malfunction of our body, our brain, and our nervous system, or our genes. Okay? So scientists teach one way to eliminate you know, the gross, painful situations. World religions teach another way, talking about having love and compassion and ethical conduct. Okay. And it's true. Yeah. Except what I see happening more and more now is people turning towards the physical means to try and eliminate suffering. Yeah. And so, you know, why do we have diseases um, due to viruses, due to gene, genetic things? Um, you know, always looking outside to try and remedy problems. But actually, if, if we look, and this, you don't have to be religious or anything to think like this, uh, wouldn't you say a lot of our problems in the world today come because people don't have very good ethical conduct? Yeah. I mean, I look around and to me, like, there's just a crisis in terms of a lack of ethical conduct. Yeah. People say killing, unfortunate, but I want to have my gun. I don't want to give up my gun, you know? And war is unfortunate, but it's an okay way to settle conflict. And, you know, the whole Me Too movement is exposing, you know, the lack of ethics that come, that come around sexual behavior, lying. We have liar in chief in this country. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. People politicking without caring for the the welfare of the people that they supposedly represent. You know, talking behind people's back and so on. Just when I look around, it it seems like, um, you know, people are not. They don't care very much about their own ethical conduct. 
And that's having a very negative effect on the country as a whole. Yeah. I mean, the civic dialogue, we used to have, I mean, people used to kind of try to talk to each other in a polite way, but not anymore. You know, the idea of being polite is kind of out the window, and being angry and aggressive is being in. And, you know, so to me, that whole kind of shift of attitude that people don't think of um, the importance of, of being polite, the importance of being considerate of other people. You know, they just, you know, I want to say this, and it's said on social media and then retweeted or whatever, you know. And, and so we can see right away how immediately um, a lack of, of ethical conduct creates so much pain in the world. You know? Not to mention then the karmic effects that the lack of ethical conduct uh, you know, will bring. Is that your reflection? Yeah? So I think kind of in our world, more and more it's up to us to be... Um, to hold good ethical conduct, you know, instead of saying, well, somebody else should, you know, get it together. And, you know, after you stop lying, then I'll stop lying. And first you stop criticizing me, then I'll stop criticizing you. But, you know, I think we have to be the one who really set an example because we, uh, we care about other living beings and because we have a sense of our own personal integrity. Yeah, and so we really put some effort into trying to be the kind of people that we admire instead of telling other people that they should change their ways. Okay, so it may be a difficult environment now, but this is um, what we have, and I think it can make us strong in our practice. Yeah. Because we have to be strong. The second type of dukkha is the dukkha of change, which refers to worldly happiness. Why did the Buddha call what is conventionally considered happiness, such as pleasant sensations, dukkha? Yeah? Why did he say this is unsatisfactory? Yeah? You eat chocolate cake, it tastes good. What's the problem with that? Yeah, you get a promotion at work and you get more money. Why is that called dukkha? Why is that unsatisfactory? Okay, you finally get your red sports car. <laughs> yeah, and it makes you happy. What's wrong with that? Okay, so nothing's wrong with that. Buddhism is certainly not saying we have to suffer. It doesn't glorify suffering. But the reason is that all those things don't bring us lasting happiness, for one. And second of all, if we do those things repeatedly, instead of making us happier and happier, they bring more problems. Okay? So you have your chocolate cake. You know, the really moist kind with nice, sweet chocolate frosting. Yeah, kind of double chocolate. And it's really, it's very, yeah, moist. And it's not a dried out chocolate cake. You know, <laughs> it's a moist one, a really good one. Okay? So it brings you happiness. Now, if that, if happiness were there inside that chocolate cake, yeah, the way it seems to be, which is why we want to go back for another piece. Okay. If the happiness were there, then the more chocolate cake we ate, the happier we should be. But what happens when we keep eating one piece of chocolate cake after another? 
oh, <laughs> you know, we get a stomach ache. Okay. So isn't that strange that the thing that we think has happiness in it, when we take more and more of it, instead of making us happier and happier, it brings pain. Yeah? So if you think of the kinds of things that we usually run around in a frenzy trying to get, any of them, if you have them long enough or do them long enough, are any of them going to bring you ultimate satisfaction? Or after a while, are you going to want a break? Yeah. So you just met this fantastic person, this great person. You're madly in love. You never want to be separated from them. Okay. So you're never separated from them. 24-7, you're with them. How long can you be with them 24-7 with no break before you go crazy? <laughs> or they grow crazy? <coughs> yeah? That's not going to work, is it? Yeah. So what seems to be the solution for all of our problems if we keep doing it, it doesn't really solve our problems. It eventually makes us unhappy. So that's the, the meaning of the second one, of the dukkha of change. Okay. So if you don't like that things are like that, you can complain, but I'm not quite sure who you're going to complain to because it's our own mind that created this situation. There's not an external creator. It's not the government's fault. This is one thing we cannot blame on the president. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He gets a break from this one. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we can't blame this one on terrorism. Yeah. Yeah, the nature of cyclic existence. Okay, so why did the Buddha call what is conventionally considered happiness, such as pleasant sensations, dukkha? Worldly happiness is unsatisfactory because the activities, people, and things that initially give us pleasure do not continue to do so. Although eating, being with friends, receiving praise... And hearing good music may initially relieve pain or boredom and bring pleasure. If we continue to do them, they will eventually bring discomfort or fatigue. Most people do not recognize worldly happiness as being unsatisfactory by nature, although many religions do. Okay, so ordinary people... They don't see the catch-22 here, but instead keep looking for the next, the next thing. Okay? Religious people of many of the world's religions see that there's something unsatisfactory in uh, pleasure from external objects, in that those objects are transient and there's no way they can hang around and keep giving us pleasure, and even if they could, the pleasure eventually becomes uncomfortable. So some Hindus see the unsatisfactory nature of worldly pleasures and seek deep states of single-pointed concentration that are far more enjoyable. Some Christians abandon worldly pleasures in favor of a state of rapture or grace. Yeah. So seeking something beyond just sense pleasure. Yeah. I think most religions are involved in that pursuit. The third type of dukkha, the pervasive dukkha of conditioning, is the fact that we have a body and mind that are not under our control. Okay. Now, 
we feel like we have control over our body. I mean, I can stretch my arm, I can move it back, I can lift it up, I can put it down. Yeah. Can I control it so I don't get old? Can I stop my body from aging? Yeah. Can I stop my bones from breaking if I, uh, you know, have an accident? No. Okay. So, so many functions of our body are totally beyond our control. And we're just left with having to deal with them. Yeah. And when we really look at it, uh, the body can be the, a pain in the neck sometimes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look at it. This weekend, yeah, we're all going to sit in the hall. See if your body can be 100% comfortable every moment of every session sitting in the hall. What do you think? Forget it. <laughs> yeah, my knee hurts, my back hurts, okay, my neck is tight, I feel like I want to stretch and walk. Okay. We find something that, you know, our body's uncomfortable about something. Always. We try one meditation cushion, then we try another one, we try a third one. You know, looking for the perfect cushion so that we will always be comfortable and never have to move. Yeah. Anybody found the perfect cushion? No. So you try a meditation bench, then you try a chair, but that chair isn't the right shape size. you got to change it to another chair. But that chair, its bottom is too hard, or its back is too much inclined, or it's too straight. So you need another kind of chair. But that chair, you know your feet don't touch the floor, or your feet <laughs> touch the floor too soon. Yeah. So then you try sitting on the floor again. Yeah. But then every, you know, everything hurts again. But it hurt when you were in the chair too. Yeah. So then you think, oh, I'll just lie down. <laughs> Yeah, so I won't go to the hall. I'll stay somewhere else and I'll lie down and listen to the teaching. But you lie down, and can, how long can you lie down before you're uncomfortable and you have to move? Yeah. Anybody here who does not move the entire night when they're asleep? Yeah. Oh, you know, here, move there. When you get when you go to bed, yeah. And you have to do this and that, get yourself comfortable in bed. Yeah. I can even see the cat, you know, she knows. She, you know, she lets me kind of get adjusted for a few minutes before she jumps on the bed. Because she knows if she jumps on the bed right away, you know, it's gonna be rocky going. <laughs> okay. So, without choice, we take a body that is born, falls ill, ages, and dies. What a drag. We did not ask for that. But we created the causes for it. Between birth and death, we encounter problems even though we try to avoid them. We cannot obtain everything we want even though we try hard to get it. And even when our desires are fulfilled, that happiness is not stable. We become disillusioned or separated from what we crave. True, isn't it? The description of the third type of dukkha, the pervasive dukkha of conditioning, is unique to Buddha Dharma. 
Neither other religions nor science identify our taking a body and mind under the control of ignorance, afflictions, and polluted karma as problematic. They don't look for the causes of pervasive dukkha of conditioning, let alone work to eliminate them. Instead, they try to make the situation better by focusing their efforts on eliminating the dukkha of pain. Having identified the pervasive dukkha of conditioning as the basic unsatisfactory condition we sentient beings suffer from, the Buddha sought out its root cause. He identified it as the ignorance grasping inherent existence and saw that this ignorance can be eliminated completely only by cultivating its opposite, the wisdom perceiving the emptiness of inherent existence. So inherent existence is a false mode of existence that our mind has projected onto phenomena for so long that phenomena then appear to exist that way to us and we grasp them as, as existing that way without even realizing that things don't exist the way they appear to us. They don't exist the way we think they exist. Okay? So we think everything we see is true. Yeah? There's an objective world out there, and this person is a jerk from their own side, and that person is a wonderful person from their own side, and chocolate cake tastes good from its own side, and salami stinks from its own side. <laughs> Except some of you disagree with me and think salami is nice, but that shows how ignorant you are. <laughs> and furthermore, you think chocolate cake isn't doesn't taste very good, which really shows, you know, like, uh, hopeless. <laughs> okay. So the Buddha identified, uh, yeah, so I read that. Here the Buddha's teachings on selflessness become important. He explained that when we search for what ignorance apprehends, the inherent or independent existence of persons and phenomena, we cannot find it. So we think everything has its own essence inside of it, that makes it what it is. Yeah, That's the way things appear to us. That's the way we grasp them to exist. But if we search for exactly what something is, we can't really isolate it and identify it. Yeah. So if we talk about ourselves, I like this, I don't like this, I want this, I don't want that. I aspire for this. You know, I walk and I listen and I talk and I do all these things. We're always saying I, 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 as an I, 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 okay? <laughs> but who is that I that does all these things? We're always talking about I. And we think about it all day and dream about it all night. But exactly what is it? Yeah. Who's this I that is doing all these things? So when you really start to analyze exactly what it is, it's, it's, it gets kind of vague and illusory. Okay. Or take money. Okay. You see a hundred dollar bill. They don't make so many of them anymore. They want you to carry godzillions of twenty dollar bills so that you don't, you know, do funny stuff. But yeah, I don't think there's I don't think there's five hundred or thousand dollar bills, are there? 
I've never seen one. But anyway, $100 bill. It's like, oh, $100. Hmm, what can I do with that $100? You know, we, we look at that $100, it appears so attractive. Doesn't it? I want it. <laughs> but what is it? It's paper and ink. Yeah, that's all it is, is paper and ink. And yet, we impute so much value to it, don't we? I mean, you don't just leave a $100 bill lying around. We don't even leave $1 bills lying around. Yeah. This is precious stuff. But what is it that makes the money valuable? When you look inside that piece of paper, where is the value in it? Where is the preciousness in it? Yeah, what is it really? Yeah. It's just paper and ink. And it's only because our minds decided in agreement that it was worth something that it becomes worth something. Yeah. If everybody in society changed their mind, then that paper would be totally worthless. It doesn't even make good toilet paper. <laughs> yeah. So it's quite interesting, isn't it? You know, we're all like, I want money, I need money, money brings security. But what is it? Okay. So this is what, you know, when we say kind of penetrating ignorance and seeing that the way ignorance holds things to exist is incorrect, this is what we're getting at. Okay. So the Buddha explained that when we search for what ignorance apprehends, the inherent or independent existence of persons and phenomena, we cannot find it. The wisdom that realizes this, the true path, has the ability to eradicate, uh, to gradually eradicate all ignorance from the mind, resulting in nirvana, the final true cessation. Here we see that the Buddha's explanation of the origin of dukkha, the ultimate nature of reality, the wisdom realizing it, and the attainment of nirvana are also unique. They don't appear in other philosophies or faiths. In this way, the Dharma, true cessations and true paths, is a unique refuge. Okay. So what is the dharma that we take refuge in? True cessations and true paths. Okay, so it's a unique refuge. The Buddha who taught this dharma is a unique teacher. And the sangha, those followers who have realized it directly, who have realized directly the lack of inherent existence, they are unique companions on the path. These three objects of refuge, as described in Buddhism, are unequaled and not found elsewhere. Okay, so when we say that the three jewels are unequaled and are unique, this is why. Okay, so it's important to understand this. We can't just go around and say, well, Buddha's better, you know, than anybody else, and Dharma's better than anything else, and Sangha's really good. You know, we can't just go around and say, you know, these things are best. We, you know, if they're unique, if they're valuable, we have to have reasons for that, and we have to understand those reasons ourselves. Okay. These three objects of refuge, as described in Buddhism, are unequaled and are not found elsewhere. The situations described in the Four Truths were not created by the Buddha. Okay, Very important, the Buddha is not a creator. The Buddha simply described things as they are. If dukkha, its origin and cessation, and the path did not exist, 
there would be no need to practice the Dharma. Of course, it is up to, uh, to, uh, up to each of us to test the veracity of the Four Truths for ourselves. By observing our own experience, we will come to know that dukkha and its origins exist. Although we may not directly know true cessations and true paths at this time, they too also exist. Through understanding that dukkha and its origins can be eliminated, we understand that true cessation can be attained. This brings conviction that true paths are the means to bring about peace in our minds. Okay, so this is really the whole layout of the Buddhist path. You know, what are we trying to do? We live in the midst of a bunch of unsatisfactory conditions, the causes of which are our own ignorance and afflictions and polluted karma. Things don't need to be like this. There is a solution. Okay, there is a state of freedom. And because ignorance is an erroneous mind, if we realize uh, with the wisdom that knows things actually as they are, that ignorance can be eliminated and nirvana can be attained. And then the true dukkha and its origins have forever ceased. Okay, so that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, we're, we're not kind of, uh, you know, here because we like chanting together and, uh, you know, kind of hanging out and, uh, you know, gee, these robes are so nice. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, we're trying to do this for a specific purpose. Okay. So then there's a reflection. Yeah, so the first point is the first two of the four truths of the Aryas describe our present experience. We are subject to the three main types of unsatisfactory circumstances, pain, change, and pervasive conditioning. These are rooted in the ignorance of the ultimate nature of reality. And two, the last two of the four truths describe possibilities a state of freedom from ignorance and dukkha exists, and a path to that state also exists. So we reflect on that. Then the third point for reflection, it is up to us to learn and reflect on these, to gain conviction in them, and to cultivate wisdom in order to free ourselves. Okay? So practicing the path is up to us. We, we you know, can't hire somebody to do it. Okay, then the next session, section, dependent arising and emptiness. Are there questions so far? Yeah. There's a question online. Mm -hmm. Someone says, I was part of a religious group that was very corrupt. They told followers they could talk and see deities, to be possessed by them, to practice black magic, and to hurt others. How can I have compassion to the people that led me down such a dark path in my youth? Mm. How you can have compassion by seeing how those people are so immersed in their own ignorance that even though they want to be happy, they're, by practicing in that way, they're creating their cause for their own suffering. Yeah. So these are people to have compassion for because they're creating the cause of suffering. Yeah. And, you know, clearly it sounds like you've realized the falseness in the path that they were teaching us. So you stay clear of that group and clear of those things that are going on and now habituate your mind with more virtuous intentions and a more realistic path, such as what the Buddha described. Okay. Does that answer the person's? Yeah. Okay, we'll see. Anything else? 
you know, sometimes we, we do follow wrong paths. And uh, the idea is when we figure it out, then we give it up, we learn from the experience. Yeah. We don't have to hate the people who taught us that, you know, and they're still stuck in it. So they're really the people to have compassion for. But we learn from, you know, our, uh, that experience and we become smarter and wiser. And now we really investigate paths uh, more using our intelligence. They said, okay. Okay, good. Okay, should we go on? Dependent arising and emptiness. In the above explanations of the four truths, several topics repeatedly arose. Ignorance, which grasps inherent existence, is one. The emptiness of inherent existence, which is the ultimate nature of all persons and phenomena. That's two. The wisdom realizing emptiness that counteracts ignorance. That's three. And nirvana, which is the state of peace attained from doing so. So another essential topic, dependent arising, ties all of these together. Okay. So I remember one time His Holiness saying, if the Buddha ever had a slogan or a brand, it would be dependent arising. Okay. The Madhyamaka text, tenant system, as explained by the Indian sage Nagarjuna, speaks of three levels of dependent <coughs> arising. The first, which is common to all Buddhist tenant systems, is causal dependence, the fact that products or conditioned things depend on causes. A table depends on the wood, which is a substantial cause. Uh, in other words, what actually turns into the table, the result. And the table also uh, depends on the people who make it, who are the cooperative condition that helps to bring about the result of the table. Okay. Similarly, our body, mind, and present rebirth depend on their respective causes and conditions. Such dependency rules out the possibility of things, happen, things arising haphazardly without any cause. Yeah, so the, this, it's, it's just one sentence, but you can sit and think about this for a long time. You know, how everything that happens depends on causes. And yet, we're always surprised when we do certain actions and then we get certain results when we wanted another result, <laughs> you know. So we don't always understand very well what the causes for happiness are and what the causes of suffering are, okay? So, you know, we do a lot of prison work here. We, can, you know, we write to inmates and so on. And I would say 99.9% .9 of the people that we work with were intoxicated when they were uh, did whatever they did that wound, landed them in prison. Okay. But when people s sit down to drink, do they think this is the cause of suffering and this could result in me doing uh, something illegal and harmful to others and, you know, wind up in prison? Do they think that? No, they think this is happy hour. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get drunk. I mean, right now, I think people know what's, what's going on with uh, the Supreme Court nominee, Brett Kavanaugh, being accused of sexual misconduct when he was 17 years old and drunk. Okay? Now, did, did he, when he was 17 years old, Okay, and here I'm assuming, well, he talks about getting drunk a lot. So whether or not he did the sexual assault or not, he himself admits that as a teenager he drank a lot. When you're 17 years old or even 18 or 19 or whatever, and you drink, do you ever think 
that you could be causing yourself a bunch of problems. Do you ever think that you could pot that you might do something that 35 years later could come back to haunt you? No. Yeah? You don't think that. You think we're all gonna go out and get loaded with all my jockey friends and have a good time. Yeah. So it's not just, you know, uh, foolish 17-year-olds that think this. <laughs> this is, you know, also an adult behavior, isn't it? And there's so many problems. Okay? So, you know, just trying to, to understand causal dependence. What actions bring happiness and what actions bring pain? Yeah? It's not so easy. Yeah. And this is not even understanding about karma. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, like, uh, you know, somebody talks about us badly behind our back, and we criticize them in return. And we think, good, I told that guy off, you know? He spoke badly about me behind my back, and I just told him off to his face, and good for me. You know, may he have a taste of his own medicine, and then we swear a little bit. <laughs> okay? But is that action actually going to bring us happiness? Yeah? When we go and criticize the guy who talked behind our back, and we criticize him, is he going to go, oh, yeah, sorry, uh, you're right, I'm wrong? No, he's not going to do that. He's going to go, how dare you criticize me? You know, you're the one who did this and this and this. And then he's going to come back at us. And then we're going to come back at him. And then the whole thing's going to keep going on and on and on, and we're all going to be pretty miserable. Yeah. But, you know, we don't think about this as something that's uh, perpetuating misery. It's just, you know, somebody ruined my reputation behind my back. I have every right in the world to ruin his. You know, and really give it to him. And look how good I did it. <laughs> yeah. And then what kind of people are we that we feel good about ourselves for trashing somebody else and hurting their feelings? Does that kind of behavior bring self-respect? Does it bring self-confidence? I don't think so. Okay? So just this thing, you know, on, on so many levels, looking at cause and effect and what things bring what effects. Yeah, it's quite profound. Okay, so understanding this kind of causal dependence, it helps us um, rule out the possibility of things happening haphazardly without any cause. Yeah. So when bad things happen to us, we usually go, what did I do to deserve it? If we know anything about ethical conduct and karma, we can answer that question. Okay? Yeah. Because things don't have ha happen haphazardly. Although, you've heard me say this before, I always find it so interesting when something bad happens, we say, what did I do to deserve it? But when something good happens, we never say that. Yeah. Okay. So dependency rules out haphazard things. Yeah. It also precludes things arising due to discordant causes. So a discordant cause is things um, something that does not have the ability to cause that result. So barley cannot grow from rice seeds 
And happiness does not come from destructive actions. Yeah. What is it they say doing the definition of insanity? Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting a different result. Yeah. But that's what we do very often, isn't it? Yeah. We do the same thing. It's like, you know, it, it's like somebody who keeps planting chili seeds and keeps expecting roses, you know? It doesn't happen like that. In addition to chemical, biological, and physical causality, karma and its effects is another system of causal dependence. Karma is volitional actions done physically, verbally, or mentally. These causes bring their effects, the rebirths we take, our experiences in our lives, and the environment in which we are born. The second type of dependency is dependent designation, which has two branches, mutual dependence and mere de designation by term and concept. So mutual dependence refers to things existing in relation to each other, long and short, parent and child, whole and parts, agent, object, and action. Okay? Our body, which is a whole, depends on its parts, arms, legs, skin, and internal organs. The organs and limbs only become parts in dependence upon the body as a whole. Okay. A hard spherical object the size of a small apple becomes a baseball only because there is the game of baseball, a pitcher, a batter, and a bat. Apart from this context, this round object would neither be called a baseball nor function as a baseball. Okay, A parent is identified only in relation to a child, and someone becomes a child only in relation to a parent. Neither the parent nor the child exists independently of each other. Okay, so it's saying everything exists in a context. Things do not exist independent of context. On a daily basis, we use conventions and terms and engage in actions based on language. Doing this does not require there to be a direct one-to-one -one objective referent for each term. Rather, terms are defined relationally and derive meaning only in the context of mutually dependent relationships. Yeah, this is actually quite important. Because often with language, we think words, you know, they must have some fixed, exact meaning. Yeah. But, you know, and some exact referent. But any object we point to can be called by multiple words. And, multi and one word can refer to multiple objects. Yeah, think about it. I mean, we say, we're sitting here in this room. But our sitting here in the room depends on a room. Yeah. We say, oh, we're at Shravasti Abbey. What in the world is Shravasti Abbey? Isn't this building? We were talking about this yesterday. Yeah. I'm at Shravasti Abbey. Yeah, I'm listening to a talk at Shravasti Abbey. Yeah. Shavasti Abbey exists in relationships to certain buildings and certain people that were put together for particular purposes. Yeah. And that's the only way we can identify what Shavasti Abbey is. The second type of dependent designation is mere designation by term and concept. 
in dependence on the collection of arms, legs, a torso, head, and so on, the mind conceives and designates body. In dependence on the collection of body and mind, the mind conceives and imputes person. In this way, all phenomena exist in dependence on mind. Whatever identity an object has is contingent upon the interaction between a basis of designation and a mind that conceives and designates an object in dependence on that basis. Okay. So, do chocolate chip cookies exist on their own out there? Yes! <laughs> but think about it. Yeah. To have a chocolate chip cookie, you need a lot of different ingredients that are put together in a certain form and baked for a certain period of time. And then you need people who see those things as edible. Yeah. If you put the chocolate chip cookies in front of uh, the stink bugs, you know, this is stink bug season, are the stink bugs going to see food? Are they going to see chocolate chip cookies? No. Yeah. So the chocolate chip cookies, you know, they exist in relation to us. Yeah. This interdependent nature is built into phenomena. If phenomena had an independent entity unrelated to others, we should be able to find the true referent of a term when we search for it. What really is the chocolate chip cookie? We say, I want chocolate chip cookies. What is it that is a real chocolate chip cookie? What is it that you're really wanting? Is it the chip? Is it the butter? Is it the flour? The baking soda? The sugar? Yeah. If somebody put all the ingredients out there, each in an individual container, is that a chocolate chip cookie? Yeah. If you got a little bit from each container and mixed it together yourself, would that be a chocolate chip cookie? What is this cookie that you want? Yeah. So if phenomena had an independent entity unrelated to others, we should be able to find the true referent of a term when we search for it. We should find, be able to find out exactly what the chocolate chip cookie is. Okay. However, we do not find an independent essence in any phenomenon. This shows that all existent objects exist by being merely designated by terms and concepts. Being dependent, all phenomena are empty of independent existence. This is the subtlest meaning of dependent arising. <clears throat> 